What do you think of Nancy Pelosi? I despise her. She's 82, right? Yeah, I think... Is she going to be there till she's like 100? I mean, people say you're being ageist, though. I think that's... I mean, no, I, mean, I am. I'm so ageist. I'm ageist and ableist when it comes to politicians. Like, not ableist in the sense of, like, you know, if you're in a wheelchair, you can't be a politician. Obviously, I don't believe that. But, like, uh, if you have, like, uh, you know, Alzheimer's or dementia, like, you shouldn't be a politician. If you can't drive, you shouldn't be a politician. It's fucking insane to me. There's been a great deal of talk about the reinvigoration of the American left since Bernie Sanders first ran the Democratic nomination in 2016. And that's also true in the media, nowhere more so than with the rise of Hassan Piker at Hassan Arbi, who is a rarity in that he uses Twitch not just for video games, but also for politics and current affairs. I caught up with Hassan to talk about a range of things from his West Hollywood home to who he thinks will inhabit the White House after 2024. What's it like to be the world's most famous political Twitch streamer? It's terrible. It's just absolutely terrible. <laughs> no one in the realm of politics knows what Twitch is. So there's no way that you can uh, describe that to someone. I met with the uh, Surgeon General. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe like a month or so ago. And the only reason why I was able to do that was because uh, someone in his team on the publicity side was a fan of mine, but like a huge fan of mine. So I'm sitting in this room full of all these like Hollywood people because he was he came out to L.A. to meet up with, uh, you know, producers, writers, influencers and whatnot, but mostly just like Hollywood people to talk to them about mental health. And, uh, you know, how important it is to destigmatize it. And of course, like, obviously destigmatizing mental health and like seeking therapy is a good thing, overall healthy. But I think in the United States of America, we have a much more prescient, much more important hurdle to overcome with respect to mental health treatment. And that is, of course, you know, affordability. Um, none of them brought that up. But uh, before I uh, derail any further, I was there. And this publicist in the middle of everyone's like, this is a song like he's got thousands of, you know, he has hundreds of thousands of people watching him every day. It's like he speaks to the youth and everyone's just like looking at me like, what is this dude doing? Everyone's like wearing suits. Surgeon General has to wear because he's an admiral. Technically, he has to wear like, you know, military gear. Uh, and I'm just sitting there with a T-shirt. I'm like, yeah. Um, so it's weird because no one in the political realm is aware of Twitch. Um, and then uh, for the most part, no one else does like politics in that space either. There's not a lot of like uh, political commentary on that on that front. So you're an outsider in two worlds. Yeah, but I mean, I make it work. I like it, I enjoy it. And it's not, I don't just do politics either. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm here in London. I'm not only doing interviews with you guys, but I'm also gonna go and like hang out with, uh, hang out with some other, you know, Minecrafters and, and get, uh, go to chicken shops and, you know, try out the food, that sort of thing. Why did you choose to use Twitch? Cause you started in 2018, right? So while you're yeah. still at TYT, we'll get, we'll get yeah. to that in a moment, but why do you choose Twitch and not YouTube or Facebook live? So I already had a presence on Facebook. I was managing TYT's Facebook operations and I was making this show called the breakdown on there and it was pre-scripted. It was a green screen show. It was pre-scripted, heavy on the asset side, which was pretty good for the time. Um, but I was really bad off the cuff. I could not speak off the cuff uh, to save my life. And I wanted to get better at that. So I thought, and I also wanted a, a space for myself. I wanted a space where I could just go to every day, like build a community for myself, uh, rather than be under the umbrella of TYT. And I knew that Twitch had a lot of gamers who I thought were not necessarily getting the best representation of the left because at the time, between like 2016 all the way to like even 2019, um, the gaming space and YouTube especially was polluted by alt-right uh, and, and alt-light and, you know, right-wing reactionary video game essayists that would really do a good job propagandizing right-wing talking points, 
that basically took you down this pipeline all the way to like actual white nationalists and white supremacist content creators, right? And there was no such uh, counter to that on the left, I thought. And I'm, you know, I look the way I do. I speak the way I do. I'm not like, I don't think I'm uh, the the regular like liberal or leftist figure that you are used to in the media at the time. So I thought, I think I'm, I'm going to show a different perspective that like you can be leftist and still make jokes and uh, and still have fun and play video games which is something I like to do. So th those, the combination of those three factors made me want to go on Twitch. I thought there was an, there was a, a, a group of young men ready for radicalization that had not necessarily seen leftist ideas in a good light. It was everything their their interactions with that kind of content was exclusively reactionary video game essayists portraying everyone as like hysterical SJWs or whatever, even though the ideas that those people on the left are, uh, were, were correct, in my opinion. They were morally righteous. Um, their presentation was not appealing to especially rudderless young men, specifically young white men too. So you, so you come out of the, the Young Turks, yeah. and without disparaging them because they do great work, but would you include the Young Turks in that? Do you, were, were you working at this really successful left-wing media company and thinking, you know what, there's a big sort of hole in our in our strategy and our yeah. audience acquisition oh, kind of sure. thing? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Um and the Young Turks is a media operation, so they're not like they're full fledged. They have a studio. They have, you know, they were they had editors, producers. It's not very easy to change direction quickly. I can do that on my own. So uh, that's the that's the biggest weakness of companies like the Young Turks, in my opinion, is that like on the internet you can't be static. Um, if it's an off season and there's not a lot of uh, stuff happening in the news. Um, I'm going to shift my attention away to fun stuff that I want to do that will still garner a larger audience and reach out to a broader audience because like I'm collaborating with other content creators completely outside of the political uh, realm and their fan base is like, oh, this guy seems like a nice dude. I'm going to check out his commentary. So you can't really do stuff like that when you're, you know, a, a, a relatively sizable media operation, even though TYT is nothing uh, in size in comparison to like a CNN, but still too big to like move quickly. Um, on top of that, I think TYT uh, is definitely liberal, not, I mean, they're, they're social Democrats, which is still unfortunately fairly radical for American politics, but I think it doesn't, uh, I don't think it pushes the envelope to where it needs to go uh, with respect to uh, long-term goals or, or even like an accurate, adequate analysis of the, the reason why there's so much structural inequality. I believe it's a fundamental part of capitalism. They think capitalism, for the most part, could be uh, repaired with uh, strict government regulation. Do you think they've become more radical in their sort of diagnosis or do you think that's more or less where it, where it ends? I think they've become more radical over the years, for sure, because things are really bad in America. They're really, really bad. So they have gotten more radical over the years. Don't think that they're like anti-capitalist though, because in order to get to the next step, I always feel like there you need to do a little bit of reading. Um, you don't have to. Um, you can you can recognize the the inherent class contradictions, uh, but you're not going to be well equipped and armed with the knowledge of like why it happens the way it does without doing a little bit of reading. And if in in America, oh, one we hate reading. And two, uh, you don't you don't get exposure to that kind of material, uh, and the only exposure you do get is usually negative. Um, anything outside of the realm of uh, neoclassical economics is seen as like theories that are crazy and wacky. So, what kind of reading? What are your favorite books? If you have a young kid and they're like, my apologies to anyone who's seventeen calling me a young kid, but you know, a young adult, and they say, look, Hassan. This is totally screwed up. So many people using food stamps. The economy doesn't work. My parents are in debt. I know this isn't how it's meant to be. It could be better, but explain to me or suggest books which explain to me why this is the way that it is and, and how we can change it. What would you say to them? Novels, Oof. nonfiction? No, I mean, it, it, literally all the classics, uh, everything from 
everything das capital is like not an easy read obviously but there's summarizations that you can find especially on the internet uh lectures and whatnot on youtube that can be helpful but anything from uh anything from marx to lenin uh i think is is definitely good as a starting point but if you don't want to if you don't want to broach into that territory so quickly um Probably Noam Chomsky is a good starting point to, to get a deeper understanding of, at the very least, why the media is the way it is. Because I think that's like a good entry point for a lot of people um, uh, to to slowly but surely understand uh, why uh, you, you recognize that the media is like kind of lying to you. It's not lying. They're just manufacturing consent. But uh, that, I think, is... Uh, good way to enter into that realm so you you, one of the reasons you did twitch was because you think that white men young white men are are prey to the far right and that the left isn't really reaching out to them why why particularly young white men because that's kind of like a a verboten thing to say on the left isn't it you know like young disenchanted disenfranchised young white men it's not not even just white young white men it's just men in general i think on the internet are there's not a lot of good positive role models for them out there. Um, but it's not just men either. Uh, obviously, everyone is uh, but you, disenfranchised with but the you, system. But you clearly think that your comparative advantage in the media landscape is reaching out to a certain demographic. I mean, there's, yeah. no, there's no harm saying that, right? So Yeah, why, no, for sure. Why young, what, why young men? What, what's, what's going on with them? If you're like their <laughs> spokesperson to the wider media, let's say you go to CNN or MSNBC, and like, why are young men so angry? Like, what would your answer be? Well, I think that... Uh, well, first of all, let me just uh, mention that obviously I'm not saying that they are the most victimized or anything like that, because there are people out there who will say reactionary things such as that. I'm simply stating that um, I recognize uh, that that they have a shitty hand dealt as well on top of everyone else, and which is why I oftentimes have a class first analysis on on. Uh, oppression that then will dovetail into intersectionality i'll be like look if you feel bad having uh if you feel bad getting you know four dollars an hour and and surviving exclusively on tips which is how like uh in a lot of places in america the service industry is how it still operates foreign concept for the uk i presume but uh if you feel like that's terrible for you Working in retail, people are yelling at you every day. Uh, your your treatment from your manager. Uh, there's a reason for that. It's because the system is designed in a way to make sure that uh, you have no way of ever uh, ever getting adequately uh, paid for your labor, um, and that you have no means of you have no mechanism <laughs> of fighting back against that. And on top of that, if you feel this way, then imagine how I don't know, like a. a a person who has been historically marginalized feels. Um, so I'll, I'll meet people where they're at and then draw larger uh, structural inequalities off of that that they can comprehend from their own personal experiences. But as far as like white men goes, I'm pretty privileged. I, I'm, I'm cishet, you know, white dude. Uh, You're Turkish. So You're Turkish though. I mean, I am, but in America, I'm white. You know what I mean? But if the shit hits the fan, you're racialized as non-white, presumably. Yeah, of course. If, like, but, that's, far, but that's, that's like how a, whiteness is, as a of concept. Of course, exactly, yeah. Yeah. But as it stands, I, I look pretty white. Yeah. So I can speak to people in a way that they will, um, in a way that, that unfortunately, they, I am the type of person that they will listen to rather than someone who is like uh, from said marginalized groups like um so i try to use that privilege for good as an entry point into further leftist uh ideas so for people watching this and not familiar with your work they might be thinking why is this guy a big deal the statistics and the data from your coverage of the 2020 presidential election are incredible so this is from i think ny mag or the ny times one of the two it's from new york Pika's stream covering the results of the 2020 United States presidential election peaked at 230,000 concurrent viewers and was the sixth most watched source of election coverage 
across YouTube and Twitch, comprising 4.9% of the market share. And I think it was also the sixth most watched election stream just on the internet. So I don't know if that includes CNN's one, which is embedded on their website or whatever. Yeah, probably. And you, you were only behind major news networks. Yeah. Did you think, did you think that was going to happen? And like, how quickly has this success jumped on you? Because I read somewhere that your first Twitch stream got 35 viewers. Yeah. So it wasn't like you went in both feet, half a million dollars saying, we're going to launch brand, you know, Hassan Abi. You grew this organically and then you got to that. Did, did you expect that? No, absolutely not. I had no idea it was going to be this successful. I always thought like, you know, I'll be like a mid-tier content creator, uh, not one of the largest content creators on this platform because it was not a platform. It, it was a platform that was like straight up hostile to politics and especially left-wing politics. Um so I never thought that I would be, I would get this level of success. I was very fortunate. Um, people were desperately looking for someone who looks like them, uh, thinks like them, understands the internet and can maneuver through the media landscape uh, with ease and, and describe certain things that were going on that they wanted uh, answers for. And uh, I got lucky, but would, such is just the way. Would you host a show on MSNBC? Would you do a podcast on the New York Times? Um, I've had offers in the past from legacy media. The only thing I see as beneficial to myself uh, in, in, with respect to like working in legacy media is it gives you legitimacy in traditional outlets. So people will be more susceptible to listen to you and definitely different demographics. Um, if you're under the age of 30, you've probably seen my commentary, my content in some way. If you're over the age of 30, however, the likelihood that you have goes down a lot. So for that reason, in order to reach a broader audience of older folks, especially, uh, I would need that. But that's that's the only reason I would ever consider it. Other than that, the uh, lack of editorial control, the freedom that I have to say whatever I want, which sometimes happens to get me in trouble, uh, is is undefeated. It's I, I'm not going to I'm not going to throw that away for uh, probably not even more money than I make at the moment. So, Is there no conditions under which a major media company could come to you and say, Hassan, we, we've got this product, come work with us? Are there no conditions? <laughs> and forget money, obviously, if they say, here's $100 million, you're like, okay, fine, I can give nine-tenths of it away and still be you know incredibly wealthy, whatever. Yeah. But professionally and politically, like if, I don't know, MSNBC said, we want you to host like a two-hour show daily, you can have who you want on, talk about what you like. Obviously, your politics are very different to like. I just don't think that that'll ever happen. Right. I Like, I have no belief that MSNBC, which only recently decided they need to be uh, less partial. And what that means is, like, they need to be more right wing, uh, is ever going to be like, let's hire someone who calls themselves a socialist. Uh, British media is incredibly reactionary and awful. But American media is pretty brutal too, especially when there's even a crumb of like uh, social democracy, like Bernie Sanders, his treatment, or rather his mistreatment in in uh, liberal media, liberal left media, uh, is is I think proof that they are uh, positioned in a way to shut off any sort of left wing momentum in this country and serve capital. So sometimes the generic answer to like combating the far right is, well, you need this alliance of the center and the left. And what you're saying is, well, actually these people are part of the problem. So uh, are they part of us? Let's say there is a Bernie 2.0 or an AOC style figure who's the, the Democrat nominee in, in 2028 or 2032. You've got a strong labor movement, a strong left media. You think those people would still be, they would be the sort of, the final, the final wall of protection, you know, stemming the tide of a rising American working class. There's a there's a couple different uh, thoughts on this. Um, I think that most people, I think most people are very fiscally progressive in this country, uh, in America. Uh, uh, Alex Perrine has a really good take on this. He says um, that uh, the most popular politician in America is a faceless, lifeless ballot measure that is not immediately associated with a Democrat. Um, because those ballot measures, like 
they are deeply progressive, like in places like Florida, where they end up voting for Ron DeSantis or where they end up voting for Donald Trump. You you will see those exact same elections uh, where where people are voting for uh, felon voter restoration. Mm-hmm. Right. That's a huge, incredibly progressive deal. Um, you'll see people, way, right? Yeah. You'll see people vote for marijuana legalization or decriminalization. Florida voted for fifteen dollar minimum wage. And that was more popular than Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Right. So obviously people are uh, when when you meet them where they're at, they are very progressive, especially when it comes to fiscal policy um, across the board. The voting population even, which is uh, a little bit uh, wealthier than the average American citizen, for sure, um, even they are more progressive. But unfortunately, uh, people have no, no way of like recognizing that or uh, there is no way of communicating that message out in an effective manner because the Democratic Party is not addressing those needs. Uh, they're not even communicating those needs or uh, showing that they will truly put up a fight for uh, the the things that they even campaign on every now and then. So for that reason, I think like uh, both parties to some respect are serving capital. Uh, and that uh, the media is definitely uh, doing the exact same thing. So these are all hurdles that uh, that you have to push back against. And uh, you mentioned there, like, let's say there's a big labor movement in America yeah. where our, our unionization rate is at 11 percent. A lot of our most powerful unions with the uh, obviously outside of the police union, which is not even a real union, but the most powerful one. Unfortunately, um, a lot of our unions are are deeply embedded within the Democratic Party's infrastructure and not in a meaningful way where they do uh, where they will every now and then out of fear that they might back someone like Bernie Sanders and then get, uh, uh, you know, get pushed back from the Democratic Party. The Democratic establishment will turn around and and <clears throat> back the establishment candidates rather than like genuine left wing, um, you know, labor candidates. So it's all it's all messed up. It's all distorted. Uh, I so I'm not I'm not exactly positive about the future of of uh, American politics. But let's say there was a candidate, they would probably get mistreated, similar to Bernie Sanders, and and probably not make it out of the primaries. That sounds quite fatalistic, and like because yeah. um, I mean you've had you've had a person who's um, an avowed democratic socialist comes second in two successive Democratic primaries, which has never happened before. Like, it was totally unprecedented in 2016. Yeah, never happened in contemporary politics. I mean, uh, yeah. like, since Eugene Debs. Yeah. You mon- haven't yeah. really, yeah, in modern politics. Yeah, you're, yeah, correct. So, I mean, surely, I can, and I can understand the, the disappointments, obviously, attendant with Sanders. I guess Jesse Jackson. There, there were some. There were Would examples. he call himself a Democratic Socialist? No. No, but I think that his viewpoint aligned with that. I know what you mean. Okay. Yeah. And he was reaching out to the same coalition as some. Yes. Yes. Okay. The Rainbow Coalition. Okay. But still, that seems like a, a, an interesting and important upsurge and shift in American politics. There's the squad, their status and power can be massively overstated. But again, it's a slight shift. Yeah. And it sounds to me like you think still long term that American institutional politics is still kind of fucked and won't address any of the problems that yeah. afflict the country. I think that's. The mechanism of control. That's the that's what it's designed to do. Um, will that stop me from participating in electoralism? Of course not. I do think, especially at the local level, organizing is really, really important. Uh, you know, we backed some. Uh, the DSA in Los Angeles got a lot of saw a lot of success in in the council elections. I mean, these are these are gigantic populations, and and there's a lot of control that you can uh, take over, uh, especially in in. I guess, uh, relatively easier to beat elections because people aren't really paying attention to them at the national level. Um, so, so I do still think that organizing is deeply important. And I do think that labor organizing on top of that is even more important. Um, so I still push for that. And I do still push to, you know, go out and vote and try to infiltrate the Democratic Party from within if it's even possible. But um, those hurdles still exist. And uh, the Democratic Party is infinitely more successful at stopping uh, leftist momentum, squashing that than than, you know, channeling that uh, grassroots mobilization power that they have 
and and using that to win elections. There, I mean, look at every single thing that has happened in in the Joe Biden uh, uh, term so far. Democratic Party has a basically non-existent majority, but still a majority, uh, regardless in the Senate, a majority in the House, uh, and also controls the White House, right? So we should be using the budget reconciliation to push for uh, bills over and over again, to push for progress the progressive agenda that Joe Biden ran on. And yet uh, it has fallen short every single time. Um, the $15 minimum wage was uh, brought to the table for a brief moment, but the then Senate parliamentarian um, said that it, it could not be put in the budget reconciliation. Um, that is a bullshit hurdle that the Democratic Party could have absolutely uh, managed. They could have just fired the Senate parliamentarian like Dick Cheney did back in the day and then hired a new person. This is not a this is not an elected position. This person is not the God King. Uh, you know, you could have just totally, if you wanted to fire the Senate parliamentarian, hire a new one, appoint a new one in that position and then put put the fifteen dollar minimum wage in there. Um, you constantly have a rotating villain within the Democratic Party that spoils the more progressive sides of their agenda. Uh, that's why there was a, the, the infrastructure bill that uh, Joe Biden ran on and, and saw as a deep necessity that even Joe Manchin himself was on board with up to $4 trillion in spending was, was uh, destroyed. It was cut in half. There was a bipartisan bill that uh, you know, was uh, spearheaded by Kirsten Sinema, a green senator from Arizona, that then used all the influence that the Democratic Party gave her in that moment to destroy the second bill, the the, the partner bill, the Build Back Better bill that uh, the Biden administration was uh, also trying to push for. And, and that fell apart. Police reform fell apart. Eight can't wait was the strategy for the Democratic Party. It was already a compromise laden bill that was going to at least federalize some of the provisions against police brutality uh, to curb back police brutality, maybe put like a fraction of accountability uh, into policing. That fell apart. No one voted for that. Um, so a lot of the uh, a lot of the promises the Democratic Party made, we haven't seen and they're not pushing for it. They're not they're not whipping for, uh, enough to get the votes necessary. Uh, within the slim uh, majority that we have. They're not bullying. They're not even using the bully pulpit. And at a certain point, you got to realize, like, maybe that's by design. Maybe that is the point. Um, that they just sit back and rely on the Republican Party's brutality to win elections. Because ultimately, if they were to genuinely push for policy changes, then um, some of those are going to hurt uh, uh, those in positions of power. I guess what's, what, what's different to the, to, between the US and the UK is that generally speaking, historically, um, high income earners vote conservative, low income earners vote Labour. It's obviously far more mixed than that, but yeah. it, that's probably the case. Whereas historically in the US, you do have a certain patrician elite on the coasts, particularly in the East Coast, that vote Democrat, which you don't, you can't really map on here to the UK. And it's true that that's like a, that's a big structural issue. But at the same time, everything you've just outlined there is hitting the bottom line of the Democrats' ability to get people elected in the midterms this year. Joe Biden's personal approval ratings are like historically low. They're worse than Trump's ever were. They're worse than Trump's. Yeah. So which is what, crazy. So should be, but surely you're a politician. You want to get reelected, like at the very least, because it's a really nice life and you like the status, you like the money. Surely, just purely by the logic of wanting to be re-elected and holding public office for longer, people would be doing a little bit of what you're saying? or Because it seems so irrational. It's like you're handing the midterms to the Republicans on a plate while doing nothing and holding all the cards. Democratic Party loves not being in power while still, being, while still holding on to their seats. So if they lose a couple seats here and there and the Republican Party controls the Senate, oh, that's perfect for them. They can just be like, we can't do anything. Look... Um, like I said, they had the majority, they still have the majority, and yet there are people within the Democratic Party that they simply cannot whip. 
that they simply cannot get the votes from. Kirsten Cinema, Maggie Hassan is another one. And of course, Joe Manchin. There's like 12, I think total of 12 senators that are that could very easily substitute for one another, depending on whichever corporate lobby is more powerful in their state uh, for whatever particular issue that we're talking about that will spoil bills, that will ruin bills, that will gut them. Uh, by any means necessary. So we don't even get to the Republican Party's evil. Uh, they're just always going to obstruct no matter what happens. Uh, but but uh, the Democratic Party spoils on its own anyway. So people see that. People recognize that. And then when uh, when the Republicans bring it back to the state legislatures and use the state legislature, which is deeply, deeply uh, uh undemocratic as a consequence of redistricting, which Republicans uh, realize is a really good mechanism of control at the state level, um, when they've already court packed like crazy and the entire judicial system is like uh, is, is, is riddled with activist judges that are reactionary Republican Federalist Society judges all the way up to the Supreme Court. They can do exactly what they've done thus far with Roe v. Wade. They can eviscerate uh uh, abortion uh, or access to abortion, a medical procedure. They can stop women from having bodily autonomy um, and they can take it all the way up to the Supreme Court and and do everything short of codifying it. They don't have to codify it when they can just uh, keep being as brutal as possible at the state level. What do you think of Nancy Pelosi? I despise her. She's 82, right? Yeah, I think- Is she going to be there till she's like 100? I mean, people say you're being ageist, though. I think that's... I mean, no, we, I am. We, we would- I'm so ageist. I'm ageist and ableist when it comes to politicians. Like, not ableist in the sense of, like, you know, if you're in a wheelchair, you can't be a politician. Obviously, I don't believe that. But, like, yeah, if you have a severe... Uh, if you have, like, uh, you know, Alzheimer's or dementia, like, you shouldn't be a politician. If you can't drive, you shouldn't be a politician. It's fucking insane to me, right? Uh, Diane Feinstein is a great example yeah. of this. She's is that the- 90, right? She's uh, 88, I think. She's like the second oldest or the oldest uh, senator. She's on the fucking Judiciary Committee. Like, did, what the hell? Like, she she's very clearly, she very clearly her staffers are like leaking to the media that she has dementia. Kind of like, like Bruce, Will- Bruce, late Bruce Willis kind of vibes, you know? It's wild. It's wild that she is still in a position of power. And this is California. All right, this, these are the California... Uh, politicians that we have. Nancy Pelosi, Diane Feinstein. That's wild. I mean, California is supposed to be very progressive, right? It's not. Do you think Pelosi would just stay there until, do you think she'll do like a, a Ruth Ginsburg sort of stay there till? I mean, she, cause she could live obviously very affluent country. If you're a healthy person, we've seen this with former presidents, right? You can live in mid nineties, you can live to a hundred and like, this is quite a new thing. Like as a society, the very wealthiest people in yeah. politics reproducing their power li- like live longer and longer. Lyndon Johnson, I think, died in his mid-60s, right? Because yeah. so these guys were smoking. They were eating terrible diets. I, I agree. They should start smoking. <laughs> that's that's a, I'm on board with that. Yeah. <laughs> start smoking and start drinking Nancy Pelosi. We know your husband does. Nancy's husband does. Yeah. Drink. He likes to drink and, and drive a little. He got busted for drunk right. driving like recently. Man's like 85. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> how do you get, how do you do drunk driving at 85? But how, okay, so here's the, anyway, because I would say the same thing as you. I think, I think, I personally think we have to have a cutoff. We say if you're below 18 or 16, you can't vote in countries. I don't think we should have an upper limit on voting, but clearly on political representation, I agree with Why you. Not? But then somebody would say to you, well, Bernie Sanders is older. Bernie Sanders is what, 79? I'm willing to I'm willing to lose out on Bernie if it if it comes down to it. I think like ultimately if you cut off 65 plus like you would dramatically alter the way elections uh elections run in this it's country. Half the Senate is like over 65 I think. <laughs> yeah. Which is it's crazy. It's a gerontocracy. Yeah. And the average age in the US is like 38. It's like a young country. Yeah. Yeah, relatively. Younger than like Italy or whatever, you know, yeah. Japan. Yeah, definitely younger than Japan. It's uh it's it's ridiculous. I mean, I don't I don't believe in like the the any sort of uh dynamic uh, of like uh you know, generational dynamics are not as important, I think, even though there is a generational divide in the way that people vote, certainly. But I'm not like a firm believer that, you know, oh, the next generation is going to save us. They're not. There's plenty of reactionary idiots in in my generation and and even younger generations as well. 
But um, but yeah, I think I, I, I'm fine with a cutoff, 65. <laughs> For political representation. Vote. Political representation. I'd say don't even let them vote. That's I'd, what I think. I'd say I think 75 is reasonable. And I think I don't see what the arguments against that are. Complete change of conversation. Let's do it. What's the average day in the life of Hassan Abi? Um, it's just I wake up at six, I start reading the news, I start listening to news broadcasts to figure out what's going on. Um start building an outline for what I'm going to cover on the show that day. Go work out, come back from working out. Where do you work out? Do you have like a gym at home, um, gym nearby? No, I have a, I, I work out with a trainer now since COVID. I started working out with a trainer uh, and, you know, I just go to their house. And what do you do? What do I do training wise? Yeah. Um, you're Turkish, you're a big guy. I, I do everything. I kettlebells. mean, we do, yeah, we do kettlebells, compound exercises. It's like my, my training regimen is always revolved around at least squatting twice a week, bench pressing twice a week, and then deadlifting once a week. And then I build like other, you know, uh, other exercises around that. But now I just, now it's way more dynamic. We do, we do a lot of different stuff, you know, um, uh, I, I swap it out for like, uh, leg raises, uh, lunges, uh, that sort of thing, rather than uh, doing just regular squatting and stuff. Because I'm 31 now. I'm about to be 31. You know, it's, my bones are old. My joints are weak. So uh, it's it's better to, you know, hyper-focus on different areas of need. Would you bench? I have no idea. Come on, you're all, you're all time... All time one rep max bench. That's a doofus I've never, question. I've never I'm hit curious. Like a, I've never hit like a PR in anything, but on bench press, I would rep at my peak. I was repping like, I could rep three plates for like three. Um, so, my bench was always the, the weakest though. So 160. I don't know in the kilograms, but it would be three plates is like 315, I think. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure. So ballpark. 315 pounds. 160, yeah. Well, yeah. maybe more. I was repping like 265 for 8 to 10. Uh, so that's, I don't know what that would be. And we can look it up. I can convert no, it's it if fine. you want. I feel like a school a schoolboy. My one rep max is 140, but then I'm, you know. But equally, I've got, sh I've got shorter arms than you, right? So, I mean, I should be. I'm no, gonna... it's easier for you. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, my I'm bench is not excuses. that strong. My bench is not that good. That's really good. My bench is. And for somebody not on gear, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Or were you? No. I would. I don't have a problem with it. I just have like a, a very addictive personality. And I'm worried that if I start doing steroids, like I will never stop cycling. And that's the reason why I've, I haven't done it. And you'd be like 55 and have a micro penis. Yeah. Because your body's still producing testosterone. Well, that um, and also like uh, my hairline has already receded. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to fuck that up further. I'm not trying to be bald. You know what I mean? I don't think your hairline looks fine to me. Oh, thank you. For 31. It's very kind. Well, no, because that's the thing, isn't it? If it's kind of more or less where it is at 30, they say you're going to have it till like 50 kind of thing. I hope. I take I, I take uh, DHD blockers for it. I take a, a like a, what is it? Propecia. Right. Yeah. Your uncle Chenk's got a decent head of hair for his age, no? He does. Yeah. Son of a bitch. He just has a gray hairline. Great. I'm already white. I, I, I'm getting like white beard hair and like white hairs coming out too. He only started having like white hair recently. Oh wow! Okay, he's like fifty. Yeah, he's very he he was blessed. Me, not so much. So you work out, you do your compound exercises, now functional stuff with your personal trainer. You go back home, then what? Um, and then I click start streaming. I start at eleven p.m. eleven a.m. Pacific, and I go for like seven eight hours every day. And the first four to five hours is usually just straight up news coverage. Uh, most important stories of the day, hit as many as I can. And then afterwards, I'll transition into like lighter stuff, uh, memes. Uh, sometimes we like to uncover old TV shows uh, that are problematic that I, I love to watch. Things like that uh, with our with the, with the community, making jokes about it, doing commentary around that as well. And then play some video games, too. And so you stream for, you said seven hours? Seven, eight hours. It used to be a lot more back in like my average every single day. I streamed every single day between uh, 2020 and 2021, pretty much every single day. And my hours, my hour 
my average came down to 10 hours a day in 2020. <coughs> and what did that do to your mental health? Because there's one interview where you describe, you describe yourself as, I think I may have the quote here, you describe yourself as having brain worms. Oh, do I, I do, yeah. <laughs> you have brain worms. I, I'm brain rotted, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, and you say, um, I think I've gotten rid of it. You say, I've got brain worms and I'm the most online person imaginable. Yeah. Well, so what did that do to your mental health, being online 10 hours a day every day? That's quite- it's Probably not good. Not good at all, but it works. I think that's like my competitive advantage that other people don't have because people are always like, how do you do it? Like, how could I start doing it? And I'm like, try, but it's not going to happen. You're not going to sit there for eight hours a day and talk to hundreds of thousands of different people and like parse through all of this information on the internet. It's just, uh, it takes a very specific kind of person to do that. And people have commented on that. They say, wow, his, his, uh- ability and aptitude in doing this is kind of, I've never seen anything like it. And, yeah. and, that, and that, you know, it's talked about by legacy media as like a really impressive form of political journalism. Is it so, is that like a skill set you had as a kid? Were you able to just like process lots of information? Yeah, really it's quickly? called ADHD. Right. <laughs> that's my skill is that I, I just, uh, you know, that's my hyper focus, I guess. I can just sit there and, and look through so much, uh, so many different uh, articles and and, you know, offer my feedback on it nonstop for hours. And then what do you I do to relax it. after seven, eight hours of streaming? I don't know. I just, sometimes I watch anime uh, or, or TV shows. That's what I do for the most part. I used to go out. I don't really do that anymore. So that's that's all I do, really. That's what I. That's how I unwind is watch TV shows. You single? Uh, right now, yes. You don't go out and you're single? Okay, that's impressive. Yeah. You need to, well, you know, before you know it, you're, you're old and uh, people are less interested. 15 years time. It'll be all right. You'll be fine. <laughs> I'll, you know? be, I'll be fine, I think. It's, you know, it's interesting as you get older, like, because now I'm 38, and it's interesting, there were friends in your mid-20s who were just like, obviously the center of attention mm-hmm. for a bunch of reasons. And it's just like, age is so strange. And now it's nobody, would, now they're like completely unremarkable to anybody. And like, they're 40. Well, really I, weird. I care more about, um, I guess I care more about like what I'm doing than anything else. You know what I mean? So that's my focus. I have the, uh, while I have my mental faculties intact and I can do this, I, I want to do it for as long as I can. So, so your your professional output in terms of your Twitch stream is way more important than your romantic life. Yeah, for sure. How come? That's that's unusual, isn't it? Because you're, you're not really. Well, you're saying you're you're quite you're quite pessimistic about the future of left wing politics in the United States. Mm-hmm. At the same time, you're clearly like just throwing yourself into this endeavor, which is obviously personally rewarding as well. But like clearly, you really really believe in it. Yeah. At the sacrifice of other stuff, and so I'm wondering, like, if there's a higher purpose here, what is it? I'm pessimistic, but uh, it, it, the future is not as bleak. Like I should admit that the, I. I have seen the left wing shift and the momentum personally in the aftermath of the 2016 Bernie Sanders campaign. So that little bit of uh, of that little glimmer of hope is what keeps me motivated. What keeps me motivated is when I go out uh, and, you know, there's a dude working behind the bar who's like, man, I love your content. I love your commentary. You took me out of the alt right rabbit hole. You really gave me a way to communicate what I already believed. And I didn't have the words for it. I didn't have the understanding for it. That's why I do it. And it happens all the time. Everywhere I go, there are people out there that are like, you've you've helped me through some dark times, which sounds weird when you say it. You're like, what the fuck? I'm just some dickhead on the internet. You know what I mean? But but that's what keeps me motivated for the most part. And do you think that the sort of the normal stuff that a successful person of your age the normal stuff is obviously like self obsession, like um, having fun, all that stuff. But do I you, do have fun. I, know I you, love what I do. Yeah, of course. Okay, so like in a formulaic sense, going to nightclubs. I'm sure you do all this stuff as well. But like I've less, done all that. Less, yeah, but less so seemingly in the last several years. Yeah. So do you find that now kind of less interesting because you're like, wow, like. I really think the US left is part of some his broader historical process, which is really important and unique. And like sure. ha- having been in that, you're kind of like, wow, actually normal life is kind of boring by comparison. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Uh, I 
I've done all that. I've, I used to party all the time. So I don't really get the same amount of pleasure from that as I do from, from streaming for sure. I, I am hedonistic. So I do, I do seek pleasure, right? And I drive a lot of pleasure from what I do. But if one day it wasn't as, uh, it, it didn't make me feel the way it does currently, then yeah, I'll, I'll drastically uh, lower my streaming hours or whatever. But as it stands right now, it might not seem important to people outside, but uh, every time I, I meet someone and I can put a face to a name, like a real human being, um, and and hear what they have to say, I, I am reminded of a, a weird sense of obligation that I have, especially for the younger generation that do uh, come to my broadcast to get the news, get their daily news. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to rob them of that. One day, randomly, just be like, "Yeah, we're not doing the news anymore." It's like if Zoom or CNN stopped stopped operating, you know, in a weird way. So I I do take that seriously, and that's that's uh, why I feel so fulfilled when I do what I do. I mean, I ask all this because it's just an outgrowth of like a level of commitment that you don't normally see, right? Yeah. I mean, I know these probably sound quite strange. Like, why is he asking such personal questions? But Obviously, you make sacrifices. If you're doing something every day for two years for ten hours, it means you you know you're you're invested in it in a certain in a certain way, which isn't normal, which is probably worth acknowledging. But I just I also wonder, like, do you ever? Well, you've touched upon it, but talking about burnout, do you think one day you might just like snap? No, because um, I regulate burnout. I I go through burnout stages as well, and I recognize that in myself. When I have a hair trigger, when I'm like really popping off on chatters. Or people randomly because there's a back and forth of flow that makes my commentary unique to other forms of media it's just how twitch is there's a constant back and forth of the chat they can be supplementary and offer additional information or points of of uh you know or, or different like uh historical precedents that i may not have uh, thought about bringing up at that moment and that's great or sometimes it could be antagonistic and usually i like to balance it out because I think that there is an educational uh, format, even with antagonism, even with like people being like, you're wrong about this, like white supremacy isn't real. You know what I mean? And I can like use that as a teachable moment. However, um, sometimes when I do recognize that I'm starting to burn out, I will fire off like I'll have a short fuse. And that's when I usually just, you know, scale it back. Maybe I'll take a day off, um, even if I don't want to. Or maybe I'll, uh, you know, switch to lighter subjects rather than doing like hardline news commentary. And that's how I self-regulate. Besides sort of any big networks coming to you, would you like to front a show or anything like that? Have you ever had any sort of strange people reach out with regards to like corporate sponsorships? Because you've got, like I said, a huge number of people watching your Twitch stream. Have you had like clothing brands or whatever say hey yeah i mean i i i say no to sponsorships quite frequently um i i i say no to more sponsorships than i say yes um video game companies sometimes if i don't like their practices i'll say no video game companies if i don't actually like the game i'll usually say no it just depends on who else is playing it too if there's like a fun if i can make like fun content out of it that's different but um yeah, I've I've said no to a bunch of to a bunch of companies. I've even said no. This is something that's relevant, actually. Like this is way back in the day when I was at the Young Turks. Kingdom of Saudi Arabia reached out to my management to do like tourism, to do like PR, which they do regularly. And I was like, no shot. And back then, I could have used that money, but I was like, no, no shot. I'm not doing that. Yeah, um, that was one of the bigger ones that I can. I, that's crazy. That comes to mind. Yeah. Well, I mean, they do this all the time. They do sports washing. They do esports washing, where they uh, the, recently they uh, there was like a little bit of controversy in the Twitch space because they brought a bunch of Twitch streamers. They wanted to bring a bunch of Twitch streamers to Saudi Arabia uh, to do like an esports Fortnite tournament. And you know, uh, one of the other larger content creators on the platform reached out to me. I was like, "What's going on? Should I not do this?" I was like, "Fuck no." <laughs> Um, definitely don't do that. And then I use that as a teachable moment to talk about the genocide in Yemen and, you know, Saudi war crimes and whatnot. Another one is, um, so David Beckham has a sponsorship with Qatar. 
Yeah. You know, and it's like, I think it's like $1.5 million. Yeah, they have a lot of money. And then, and then, but like, you know, he'll share something for pride on Instagram. And you think, <laughs> you're taking money off people who've like criminalized homosexuality. That, okay. Yeah. Very strange. Yeah. And what was another one as well as um, Israel as well as a lot, right? With even yeah. like relatively small minor celebrities. And it's just like, wow. I mean, it's such a cheap way of like, like you say, whitewashing your country's reputation. It's really interesting. Bobby Lee, who's a comedian, famous comedian in Los Angeles, recently was talking about this on his podcast where he was like, you know, one of my most like, he said something along the lines of like, I really regretted doing something when I was, you know, much younger, uh -huh. where apparently like, they flew him out to Israel and they told him like, you have to tweet positively about Israel while you're there. And he was like, man, it was really fucked up. They were just like straight up telling me to like at IDF every day. You That's know what crazy. I mean? Like, the Israeli government, like I had to tweet at them and say positive things like, oh man, the weather's so nice at IDF. And it's really strange seeing that. It's really strange like how, how uh, innocuous it may even seem, but ultimately the the larger goal of like whitewashing an apartheid you know colonial settler state is is pretty nefarious but even in those like little moments that's how that's how people can uh, get away with doing some pr you mock the uk a lot on your twitch streams oh my god i'm sorry yeah, i do what you could the oi bruv thing yeah <laughs> so what why why what what's I, the what's for you as hassan abi you know there's this voice of um Gen Z left wingers in the US. What's so funny about British politics, British culture? <laughs> Everything is funny. Come on. Uh, we were just talking about this uh, before we started, but uh, what's the public defenders called here? Yeah, criminal barristers. It's like, it's like, okay, dude, uh, it, it, it's very pompous, <laughs> but I like it. I, I'm fascinated by it. I'm teasing. I'm no. here, right? I mean, if I hated the UK, I wouldn't show up. But I, I, what, what, what do you find particularly like? eccentric about you said pompous but what what as an american i think it's obviously most americans are like oh wow they think britain's like downtown abbey or something clearly you don't think that and i know i i think british politics is awesome one because like obviously there's more like uh there's a there's a longer history of like labor momentum shouts out to margaret thatcher for ruining that obviously but like um there is a there there are well-established like labor uh, uh, you know, safe havens pretty much that don't exist in America at all. So you have that on the one side, but then because of that, I think you see like a very clear cut class distinction that doesn't really exist in America. Obviously it still exists under capitalism, but it's not as highlighted in America as it is in uh, the UK. Like Tories uh, until recently, until you started getting that Americanized style of politics of like Boris Johnson using populism to be like, you know, we care about the working class when they don't, obviously. Um, uh, you, I, I feel like Tories were very uh, openly uh, showcasing their disdain for the working poor. Uh, and I find that really strange. Like you have the nobility, you have the monarchy, these old relics of, of, uh, you know, crystallized uh, uh, class distinctions that I find to be really, really interesting to see. And people openly praise it, which is wild. Like you got lords and shit. That's, that's You don't think that's wild? Yeah, it's really screwed up. How the fuck do you have a lord? Like, what? what is this? Like, I thought we chopped the heads off of those motherfuckers. Like, why, why, why are there lords still? You know what I mean? Um, and I find that really funny. I find it really interesting. Do you think that's quite a common thing in the US that people, I, I know sort of some people find it like interesting, like a sort of fairy tale story or whatever, but like on a practical political level, wow, you have like a legislature with people who are there because their dad was there. Is yeah, that that's wild. We have that too. We have the Kennedys. We have like, we, we have a, a different version of that. Um, just like, uh, you know, we still have bribery. We have just codified it we legalize it in the form of corporate lobbying right so it's different um but we have we have the the same exact like uh you know lineage based politics uh it's it's just more so divided along the lines of class and you can uh muddy the waters pretty easily when it's just about rich versus poor when it's just about capital owners versus uh the working class so in a sense uh, America has done like uh, neoliberalism better than the UK has. 
maybe because of the ancient, uh, like the antiquated ways of like showcasing nobility and like maybe even praising it. It doesn't exist in America in a similar capacity. So I think America has done a better job of like uh, uh, basically mystifying uh, class antagonism and then finding new methods of division, uh, which makes it much easier to control the broader population, especially the working class. I'm going to talk to you about your house. Is that all right? Yeah. No, the controversial no. house. Yeah. The mansion. Oh, yeah. The, so you paid $2.7 million for it. Sure did. Well, I didn't. I took out a uh, mortgage. I mean, mortgage it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is- I don't have that kind of money. Like maybe $2 million, pounds, I guess. Um, now, my view is- What can I get for that here in London? In London, not much. Like, like a cave, like a little closet. Honestly, for $2 million, if you were to live in like a nice part- It's a nice part of LA. Yeah, that's, what, that's what I mean. No, yeah. so I was researching. I was like, the equivalent in London is really, and you want to have a family house. If you want to have kids, you know, there's an interesting story when Mark Carney joined the Bank of England, the governor of the Bank of England. He was given like a salary of like 450,000 pounds and an allowance and obviously loads of like add-ons. And he said, look, I've got four kids. I, I can't live in zone. I can't rent a place in like zones one or two. That's crazy. With this salary. 450,000, I can, but it's like, this is ridiculous. Like yeah. I've worked at Goldman Sachs, you know, this is, I can't, I can't live like this. And now that, you know, success is on like 650 or something, but it's like, you know, a city's fucked up when a, cent a central banker can't, yeah. can't do that. I mean, my view with your house is not that the mass is what I think. If you worked hard for it, you're not exploiting people and you live there. I mean, I, I don't really care. Yeah. And but I was renting in the same neighborhood for years. So it's funny that they were like, what the fuck? He bought a house. But I, well, yeah, but I wonder, like, is there a red line for you? With spending? Yeah. yeah I mean, I'm not going to buy a private jet. I'm not going to, you know, that's like, there are, there are definitely certain things that are beyond the pale. But the red line for me mostly is the same distinction between personal property and private property for the most part. Right. Um, as far as like uh, crazy expenditures goes, this is a crazy expenditure. I flew out the UK for no reason other than the fact that I could and I wanted to, you know, shoot some content out here. So things like that, um, those are lavish expenses, but I consider that to be appropriate and I can do that and it's well within my means, well below my means really. Um, but other than that, I mean, my red line is, is simple. I'm not gonna become a landlord. I, I think that that is disgusting and parasitic. I'm not going to like buy houses or an apartment complex and be like, and 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 have that capital accumulate. I don't even have a credit card. <laughs> and that's a, that is a really, and that's a good red line because I think, I mean, my colleague, Michael Walker talks about this the other night. We were talking about somebody who's running for the Conservative Party leadership. He might not be in it by the time this broadcast. A guy called Nadim Zahawi. Mm -hmm. He's got a property portfolio of like a hundred million pounds. Oh. Right, and the thing is, somebody like that will get less heat than, say, let's say a left-wing politician went out and buys a, a five thousand pound suit. They were upset about uh, uh, Jezza's uh, apartment that he lives in. His house, yeah, yeah, his a house. terrace house, yeah. Which because, and not even because like he put it on the market or anything, because his neighbors put it on the market and it was like two million. Uh, pounds or something and they were like look look at the fancy neighborhood he lives in look at the fancy house he lives in and I'm like that looks like a normal house yeah it is a really normal house it's a normal house he lives well within his means like he he's a he lives a modest life but they punish him over it because you're not supposed to be successful if you are a socialist you're not it's propaganda and it's right wing propaganda but it's so effective because capitalist dogma is so much a part of our lives without us even recognizing it, that even people on the left will take the poverty cult mentality and, and, uh, and bring it up when it comes to socialism, when it comes to left-wing politics. And now when I say this, no matter how uh, I, I present this, even though I had this exact same attitude and exact same opinion when I didn't have this uh, level of wealth, um, people are gonna say, you're just trying to defend yourself, but it's the truth. It's it's a reactionary uh, a reactionary attitude towards uh, left wing movements have taken up so uh, taken root so deeply at our very core that we are doing reactionary propaganda. We're not even letting the Republicans do it. We're doing it to ourselves. So so with with Corbyn, I suppose it, he's an easy one to defend because he is you know he gets his clothes from charity shops and stuff. But even if he had like a five thousand pound suit or spent. 500 pounds on a haircut. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, ridiculous thing to say about Jeremy Corbyn, but 
that's not the same from what you're saying in terms of personal expenses and then being a landlord. These are qualitatively different. I agree with you. That's a really good red line. Yeah. But I suppose then another counter argument is, well, you see yourself as an avatar of a progressive movement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Buy a... Buy a thousand dollar suit. Don't buy a five thousand dollar suit. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And I, suppose- I, I bought a I bought a shirt. Um, I bought a Gucci shirt first time ever. Normally, everything I like currently everything I'm wearing is free because you know I have friends like the designer of this is a friend of mine is a right. fan and he sent me this. It's a uh, online ceramics. They do great full dead shirts. Everything I'm wearing currently is pretty much free with the exception of the shoes I bought yesterday because we were doing uh. We were doing a stream. They're Nike, by the way. Nothing. Uh, yeah. They're not like, you know, Gucci. Yeah. And other than that, I I always thrift. I thrifted my entire life. I was a Max Anista. You guys have TK Max here. Uh-huh. We have TJ Max. Um, my entire life. And and like, but I, I, I want to wear nice things every now and then. Like, I'm going to buy something nice every now and then. What's it to you? Everyone, everyone should be able to make purchases like this. I have no issue with that whatsoever. And um, uh, like- if that gives you happiness, which material possessions for the most part don't, unless there's like additional meaning to it, um, then I firmly believe that, you know, life is too short and and too arduous and, and awful for the most part to to cast that aside for some reason. Like people want to it's a it's a very, I would say, American attitude to be like to 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 whip yourself, to self-flagellate. To be like, look at how much I'm suffering for socialism when it doesn't have to be that way. As long as your morals are not compromised, as long as you are not doing anything like inherently exploitative, then if you have money, you should be able to buy things that you want to buy. I don't give a shit. I suppose if you went to somewhere which wasn't quite so nice and you bought like a two bed flat, you'd be accused of gentrification. That 100%. You, cannot, you can't but, win but, but that's the whole point. It's not actually about... Uh, it, no one is making a, a moral argument there. They're just trying to find hypocrisy so they can just cast doubt on your integrity, on your legitimacy, on your moral compass. Um, partially because they don't want to believe that there is someone out there who like truly believes what they're saying. Uh, partially because everyone is really pessimistic, especially when you're in the media, you see so much, you see so many people like spreading lies and you assume like, well, this guy's probably grifting too. Um, another part of that is because people are justifiably angry, but they're angry at the system. They're angry at the hand that they've been dealt, but there is no vector for that anger because structural change is really hard. It's virtually impossible in America because we have no mechanism for structural change. We have no labor unions. We have no uh, method of saying like, we're going to stop this. We're going to do a work stoppage, right? Um, so people lash out at whoever they can. And I am an incredibly accessible figure. Um, so that uh, oftentimes turns into the the chaotic like news media cycle of manufactured outrage surrounding a purchase of mine. I bought a nice car as well. I have an electric Porsche. People were very upset at that. Um, I drove a 2010 Toyota Camry uh, my, you know, my entire uh, adult life pretty much. Uh, drove it to the ground when I used to have that car they would say, oh, he's LARPing as a poor person. He's using this car to show like, oh, I'm just like you. I'm, I'm poor. I'm poor schlub, just like you, the everyday man. Well, um, so there's no winning. So I just do whatever I want to do. So I, I, agree with, I agree with virtually everything you've said. But again, there's a counter argument. Say with the car, I think, again, it's a nice electric car. Good, you know, good for you. I think, obviously, we need to cycle more. We need more rapid urban transit but we don't have you don't the, have it in the u.s exactly the the problem is like uh especially if you're not in america like our cities are uh as a consequence of the car lobby and as a consequence of like oil and gas industries uh endless efforts sure. our our city planning is eviscerated we don't have walkability uh we, we don't have any walkability in our cities we have no adequate public transit like these things do not exist in most cities in america but my, my, my point is something you said a moment ago about if it's your money, spend it how you like, get what you want. And I agree with that to a point. But if you think about, for instance, like diets, we know that the planet the planet can feed about 2.5 billion people with the average US diet. And it can feed about 10 billion people with the average South Asian diet. Mm-hmm. Um, so I suppose it, when you're a leftist and you care about climate change, ecological sustainability, 
there is a certain point where you have to say, well, well, there's a certain argument or mode of thinking where you say, I won't do this because not everybody could do this. So I suppose the house is irrelevant because everybody should be able to own a house. But for instance, um, if you had three electric cars, right? I suppose one electric yeah, car. Yeah, no, that would be ridiculous. Because, but you're saying people can spend their money how they like. No, so there I is. A, no, there no, are, I know there is a there, there is a gray area in between. Like, yeah, if I had a family and they needed a car, I could get a second car. Mm. You know what I mean? I think that's uh, understandable. But if I'm like, if I have a fleet of vehicles, uh, you know, then they're just sitting there. I'm so not there is an anything. argument about living within. There, no, no, for sure. A broad and narrow think, set of means. I do think that, like, I have a hard red line on, on you know, exploitative capital accumulation um, in the form of private property. But then I have, like, I there's an understandable uh, gray area as well. And for some people, that gray area is purchasing a house or purchasing a car, a nice car. For me, it's not. It's within my means. I'm 30 years old. I don't want to, I've always like, you know, I, I grew up in the same way that everyone else did looking at these sorts of commodities and being like, oh, that'd be so sick to drive. Um, you know, if I'm going to improve my daily experience, uh, even by a fraction, I see that as like a valuable thing to spend on, especially because, and, and the car I leased as well. It's not like I bought it, but even then it doesn't matter. I could have bought it. Um, I see that as a understandable purchase because Again, I don't really do anything. I, I just spend all of my days <laughs> on camera. <laughs> so uh, if I'm going to be able to improve like one part of my life in a meaningful way, then why shouldn't I spend it on that? That's the way I see it. Is Biden going to win in 2024? I don't know. I don't know. I uh, It's not looking too great right now. We we wanted to get like a you know, middle of the ground, moderate guy in who is best position to defeat Donald Trump. That was the media narrative. Biden is the guy. It's a tautological argument because it's uh, it, the media promoted Biden because they claimed that he was the best to defeat Donald Trump. But the argument for why uh, Biden was the best to defeat Donald Trump was because the media said so. So then you created a weak incumbent. And now uh, Biden is less popular than Donald Trump. And it's and the Democratic Party is being incredibly irresponsible, uh, aside from their criminal negligence of refusing to push back against the Republican control. Um, the the argument presented to the voters is just go out and vote even harder this time around. Well, we did that already. We went out and we voted. We put you in power and Republicans are still running the country. So the expectation from like average citizens to go out and do that again with the hopes that like maybe this time uh there will be some change or maybe this time there will be a little bit more meaningful pushback from the democratic party when they've shown over the past two years that there isn't meaningful pushback is is really silly and i think it's a dangerous uh gamble towards you know accelerated fascism at this point in america yeah the sort of the text messages that you were getting from like nancy pelosi and, oh. the, and the democratic establishment after roe versus wade like this is big or whatever you know and like yeah oh is it like i know it's big <laughs> The other part of that is like Republicans have already been ripping like abortion uh, access to shreds in red states already. You got states like Mississippi. There's one fucking abortion clinic. You know what I mean? Already because they had trap laws where and and um, they use like legal red tape to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, abortion was not being provided. You have family uh, uh, planning centers like crisis uh, uh, planning centers that uh that set up shop right near adoption agencies that purposely position themselves as abortion clinics when uh, the doctors inside will legally lie to you and tell you that, uh, you know, the baby can listen to classical music in like a week or whatever the fuck, you know what I mean? To stop you, to, to make like sure that fake, you don't these get These are like the fake abortion clinics. Yeah. And there's more of them How than there are abortion clinics. Oh, yeah. Ads. Oh, yeah. How fucked up is that? That's crazy. And we had that before Roe v. Wade was was eviscerated by the Supreme Court, a Supreme Court, which uh, all three of Donald Trump's picks uh, just straight up lied and said they would not overturn Roe v. Wade, that they saw that as a super precedent. That was another big one, too. So our trust in institutions is at an all time low for that reason as well, which is understandable as someone who has never really trusted the American institutions ever. 
uh, I, I, I welcome that uh, anger that people feel towards the resentment that people feel towards these like unelected, uh, you know, grand wizards that have so much control over people's lives in lifetime positions. It's, it's crazy. There was this poll out the other day. Um, it was commissioned by the NYT and it asked people, do you think the United States economy is doing excellent, good, okay, and then poorly? And amongst all age cohorts, I think it was one, literally 1% 1 said excellent, which I, I kind of find it remarkable. But then amongst 18 to 29 year olds, it was 0%. And then amongst basically under 64, it was only like 1%, 2% thought it was good. And that's never happened before. Like in a in a in a in a well, it has and probably why my Germany probably in 1932 that's probably how people felt. Yeah. And you just use the word accelerated fascism. Like where do you see that ending in say five, ten, fifteen years time? If you have if you have literally nobody thinking that the economy is working for them, apart from 0.5 percent of that sort of billionaire class or whatever, 0.05 percent. Yeah. What 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 does the United States look like then in five, ten, fifteen years time? Well, because there is no. Uh uh, because neither party is offering uh, material restitution in any meaningful capacity, we have created this two-party system that always finds bipartisan compromise when it comes to deregulation for the most part. Okay, The Democrats are not super against deregulation. They'll let the Republicans do it, and then they won't reverse it oftentimes. Um, there is bipartisan support when it comes to uh, American imperialism across the board. No one is touching that, right? Military spending can be as inflated as possible. Uh, the Biden administration has given more money to the military than the prior, the Trump administration did. Democrats under the Trump administration gave more money to Trump's military uh, than, than even Trump had asked for, right? Um, so there is like, there is always uh, bipartisan support when it comes down to uh, economic issues uh, uh, that that uh, deregulate the industries, that uh, uh, cut taxes for the wealthy and corporations. There's people in the Democratic Party who are totally on board with that as well. Um, so we have created wedge issues instead. That's why abortion is a big problem in this country. It's totally manufactured. It's totally fabricated. 75% of the country since uh, Roe v. Wade's decision happened uh, has, has held on to the belief that uh, Roe v. Wade should be the law of the land, that um, you should not touch the that the federal government should protect a woman's right to choose, especially up to the first trimester. And and now uh, and, and of course, like Republicans, uh, Republican uh, think tank creators like Paul Weyrich that created the moral majority and these like, uh, you know, Catholic and evangelical Protestant uh, Christian groups. Uh, realized that a good way to mobilize the base was through uh, segregating schools again and also the abortion conversation. So they decided this is a good wedge issue to focus on. We can um, actively bring new voters to the table. They'll go out and they'll vote at every election, right? And they'll vote for whoever the Republican is. We'll tell them we're going to actually do everything in our power to to undermine a woman's right to choose and um, and we'll deliver results no matter how difficult it is. And it'll take 30 years, 40 years, but we'll still do it. No such thing exists on the Democratic side. The Democratic Party is constantly in a state of defense against reactionary policies being put forward by the Republican Party that activates certain parts of their base. Um, and, and that's why you have uh, the abortion conversation. That's why you have uh, uh, you know, certain aspects of the immigration conversation that's uh, still uh, pretty much universally supported, like uh, uh, the amnesty programs are way more popular than you would think. And uh, like uh, giving a, a pathway to citizenship to all members of uh, the DACA program that was an executive order under Obama is like 90 percent uh, universal background checks for guns, 90 percent. Um, closing, you know, the gun show loophole and other things like that. Uh, these are broadly popular ideas, and yet the Democratic Party can't push for it. Uh, and and there's this song and dance that the media plays a role in, uh, it, making it seem as though these are divisive issues when they're not. When they're not divisive issues, they're only divisive because there is one party that is claiming that this is an issue that like a lot of Americans believe in. But that party also has taken on. Uh, the idea that uh, the American election system is completely fraudulent, 
right? Um, they've been saying this for a very long time and it's become, um, it, and, and Trump has communicated that anger and frustration in like a way that the layman can understand. Uh, and that's why you saw the January 6th insurrection and things like that happening. But uh, the idea that uh, the American elections are fraught with, uh, with voter fraud as a consequence of illegal immigrants coming in and like secretly voting for the Democratic Party is is a very uh, I mean, it's it's been around since like the 80s, especially 80s, 90s, maybe not like Reagan amnesty era, but like after that, that's always been a, a Republican Party idea. Why? Because that's how you can justify uh, suppressing uh, certain voter populations. That's how you can justify closing polling stations. That's how you can justify uh, not making uh, a, 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 the, the day to vote a, a national holiday, a federal holiday. All these sorts of things, uh, all these sorts of uh, uh, methods of suppressing the vote that the Democrat, I mean, the, the Republican Party relies on can only be achieved if they lie to people and claim uh, falsely that elections are stolen by the Democratic Party uh, who use undocumented immigrants. That's a lie. It's, it's not real. But I suppose, where does that end up? Because especially within this context of inflation, you're seeing inflation now like 10%. If you're going to see it, say, the same next year, maybe higher, maybe lower, who knows? But let's just work on the, the assumption it's here to stay for a little while. The whole the, the whole Democrats pitch to like young voters, to people of color, et cetera, is values. And, and when you've got inflation at 10, 15% for two years, people haven't got fucking values. People's values are, please, I want to stop getting poorer. And there doesn't seem yeah. to be a response to that from the Democratic Party. So what, what, what does that look like in, like I say, five, 10 years? I mean, I spoke at TED in Vancouver, which is great fun because it was talking to people in North America I'd never normally get to talk to. And even there, like the quintessence of like the North American patrician elite, even there, one or two people after a few drinks would say, yeah, I think secession or civil war isn't impossible in my lifetime. Secession from the other side, right? Or at least yeah. a declaration of secession by a particular state and it might not work or whatever, but they they really feel there's a that nineteenth century feel to U.S. politics, kind of like the the the, the norms and the um and the the presumptions of the twentieth century have just gone, and they wouldn't be surprised if those things happen. Put it that yeah. way. But this time, the difference is, I think that um, there is no there is no robust labor movement as a counterbalance, and and the the counter is fascism versus uh, neoliberal uh, politics. And neoliberalism is good in times of, of no chaos, but um, I don't think it has any sort of, I don't think it has any sort of way of pushing back against the fascist control because fascism is a mechanism of control. You can still have like a capitalist, uh, uh, you can still have a capitalist organization of the economy and use, you know, totalitarian means of control to make sure that the population can't rise up against it um so i think that's where we're headed because there's no organizing organizing on the side of capital has always historically leaned towards uh, fascism as a mechanism of control in times of need germany's a great example of this um and i don't know if there's any like how how could the the uh democrat controlled federal government push back against that they they have nothing they can't they they still talk about the infallibility of American institutions uh, when people don't have trust in those institutions anymore. You can scream from the mountaintops about the importance of the Supreme Court. But at a certain point, people are going to be like, I don't give a shit about these old dickheads in robes. Like, how the fuck? Why, why do they get to uh, destroy my life? You know what I mean? There's a 10 year old girl in Ohio that couldn't get an abortion. The 10 year old girl in Ohio had to go to Idaho to get an abortion. Why? because of uh, Ohio's insane, antiquated, barbaric uh, laws that basically make it illegal to seek an abortion. I mean, that's that's so brutal. People like to say socialism or barbarism, but I mean, barbarism is here in America. It's here in the UK too, in many meaningful ways, but it's especially uh, uh, present in, in the United States and people are recognizing it. And, um, that's why I'm, I'm saying like the Democratic Party is really fucking up by not recognizing that, uh, yeah, if you want to make a, if you want to put together a broad coalition of like left and center on politics, you're going to have to lean on uh, genuine momentum from the left. And they're, they're not interested in that. 
So I don't know where we go from here. So I will try to do my very best to educate people, to agitate people as well, um, to help them recognize their class position, to help them understand why they're angry and try to channel that frustration in the more productive means rather than uh, blindly lashing out at whatever the fuck they can, uh, whoever they can and getting upset about like a TV show that was voice casted by a problematic individual or some shit. Um, that is... Uh, that that is only something you do when you're pathetic. That is only something when you do when you're powerless, when you feel that sense of powerlessness. That's why you lash out at like culture, because there's no other avenue where you can make meaningful change. So you just focus on like maybe changing a TV show in a in a, you know, in, in some way, in a dramatic fashion. Um, that way you feel like you've done some progress, but you haven't. Like the same structures that undermine marginalized people still exist and continue to exist <clears throat> and continue to become more and more brutal every day. That's why I, I, I don't know. I try to not engage in any sort of petty infighting. And, and when I see cringe shit from the left, I just look away. Hassan hmm. Abi, get there. Check it out. Is that how, you say, them? how do you say thank you in Turkish? Oh, teşekkür ederim. Teşekkür ederim. Teşekkür ederim. Teşekkür ederim. Yeah, that was great.